Warning, this video is based on a true story. While there are no graphic pictures, the following video describes physical abuse, kidnapping, assault, and murder, which may be disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. It's February 27th, 1995 in Springfield, Missouri. The bodies of 35-year-old Cheryl Feeney and her two children, 6-year-old Tyler and 19-month-old Jennifer, were discovered inside of their separate bedrooms of the residence. Cheryl and Tyler had been bludgeoned to death while Jennifer had been strangled and the house completely ransacked with hate messages painted on the walls. And while this family was brutally assaulted, husband and father John Feeney was allegedly at a conference 90 miles away. Although as investigators combed through the evidence and witness statements, they began to suspect that maybe he wasn't in his hotel room that night at all. In fact, a convenience store clerk would tell investigators he saw John Feeney gassing up his Mustang in Springfield, Missouri at 1.30 a.m. on the night of the murders. So as the evidence mounted, John Feeney would be indicted by a grand jury and charged with three counts of first-degree murder, for which he would face the death penalty. The prosecution and the defense would both gear up with what would be dubbed Springfield's version of the O.J. Simpson trial, the trial of the century. So who would the jury believe? Did John Feeney really murder his entire family in cold blood? Well, you're about to find out. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching Lawyer Up. In today's episode, we are going to take a look at the murder of an entire family in Southwest Missouri. And this is another video that hits close to home as I was a senior in college in Springfield, Missouri, getting ready to head to law school when these murders occurred. So we're going to look at the facts of the case, the evidence, and view some actual crime scene photographs. We will talk about the alibi and look at the physical evidence, which points more towards a staged crime scene than a real home invasion. Then we will look at the trial and how the jury put all of those pieces of evidence together along with the testimony to paint a clearer picture of what happened to these three victims, all in today's episode. If you enjoy the episode, hit that like button for me. If you got a comment or a question, put it in the comment sections below. And if you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Subscribe to the channel now. So come with me to Springfield, Missouri, which is home of Bass Pro Shops and Springfield style cashew chicken. It's 1995 and Springfield boasts a population of 150,000 people. It's not a small town, but it has a small town feel because it's safe and it has an extremely low crime rate. So let's talk about four of its citizens. We will start with John Feeney, aged 35, the family's patriarch. He was a teacher for Springfield Public Schools and had spent the prior nine years working as a chemistry teacher at Glendale High School. His wife, Cheryl Feeney, also aged 35, worked as a team leader in the gynecological surgery department at Cox South Hospital. The two had been married for 13 years. The family lived in a house in a nice subdivision in southwest Springfield and had two children, a six-year-old son named Tyler and a 19-month-old daughter named Jennifer. On the afternoon of Saturday, February the 25th, John leaves the family residence and drives 90 minutes north to the Tantara Resort at Lake of the Ozarks to attend a conference for math and science teachers called Interface 95. And yes, that is the same area that the hit Netflix show Ozark is set in. So John drives up on the 25th, goes to dinner, then to his hotel room, or so he says. 
He attends the conference on the 26th, stays another night, and then wakes up early on the morning of Monday, February 27th, in order to deliver his own presentation. Shortly after his presentation concludes, he returns to his hotel room to discover that he had a message from Glendale High School that had been left about 9.30 a.m. that morning. It would later be determined that the family babysitter that was scheduled to watch little Jennifer that morning while Cheryl went to work was unable to get a hold of Cheryl. So the babysitter had attempted to call John at the high school to see what was going on. After getting the news that Cheryl was unavailable, John then tried to call his house and left a message after no one answered. John then called his parents and Cheryl's only to discover that neither had heard from her. And there are differing accounts as to what happened next. One account is that John contacted the Greene County Sheriff's Office and asked them to go to his house to check on his family. And then he called his mother to meet them there as she had a key and could unlock the front door to let them inside. However, a later version is that a co-worker of Cheryl's named Teresa Ballinger became concerned when Cheryl failed to show up for her shift and didn't respond to calls to her residence. Ballinger then took the initiative to drive to the family residence to check on her. When she arrives, she knocks on the door, there's no answer, so she turns the knob and discovers that the front door is unlocked. When she stepped inside, she discovered that the house had been ransacked. Startled and scared, she calls 911. George Perigo, a deputy with the Greene County Sheriff's Office, would respond to the call, and he would also venture inside. It was dark, with the sunlight peeking in and around the closed blinds. The house was in shambles. There were drawers emptied onto the floor and what looked like paint tracked all over the carpet and the tile and the linoleum. Was someone still in there? He listened. The silence was deafening. He calls out Cheryl's name. No response. And then his nose sensed a metallic, rusty scent and he knew what it was. Blood. Walking down the hall, he pushed open the bedroom door and discovered a body. It was Cheryl Feeney. In the next room, he would find Tyler and finally the little baby. All three brutally murdered inside their respective bedrooms at the residence. Crime tape was draped around the residence and the South Central Missouri Major Case Squad began its investigation. The first order of business was the bodies. Cheryl had been bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument and was lying face down on her waterbed. Her autopsy would confirm that she had been beaten 10 times and had four bruises on her arms, indicating defensive wounds. There were also two puncture wounds, possibly made by a knife on her left cheek. The words die and bitch had been splattered on the bedroom wall in beige paint. In the next room, her son, Tyler, was also beaten to death after being struck seven times. He was found on his bed with a pillow over his face. Law enforcement would conclude that both Tyler and his mother were struck with a metal pipe, but the actual murder weapon was never found. Baby Jennifer's body was found inside her crib and she had been strangled to death. The baby had a dark brown ligature mark, which is an indention or a furrow, as it is called, along the pressure point of the strangulation. There is a whole science behind it, and in this case, experts believe that a thin drapery cord or a shoelace was used. But once again, the actual murder weapon was never located. Cheryl was wearing a nightgown and both children had on their pajamas. So it was clear that they had been murdered in the night while they slept. The thermostat on Cheryl's waterbed had been cranked up to its highest level, which accelerated decomposition, making it difficult for law enforcement to pin down an exact time of death but almost certainly the family had been murdered during the late evening hours of February 25th or the early morning hours of the 26th. Once the bodies were removed from the house, attention then turned to the physical crime scene. The point of entry was thought to be the back door, which appeared to have been pried open. However, upon closer inspection, it became apparent that the screws 
on the strike plate, which is the plate in the wall that the door latch and the deadbolt slide into, were deliberately unscrewed rather than pried from the wood as you would expect from a forced entry. And that can only happen if the door is already open. So someone had opened the door and manually unscrewed each screw. And the actual pry marks that were in the wood, they were near the latch area and not up around the deadbolt lock, which is where you actually need to be prying if you are forcing your way through a door. As they investigated the inside of the house, they noted, of course, that the house had been ransacked. Numerous drawers were pulled out and the contents dumped onto the floor. John Feeney would ultimately report that around 300 items had been stolen from the residence, including jewelry and several electronics. On the surface, the motive appeared to be a robbery. However, a decent amount of cash was left behind at the residence. And there were a number of other odd details, such as the family photos in the home being turned around to face the wall. In the garage, authorities found the light bulb in the garage door motor had been loosened so that it would not illuminate when the door was raised. They also noted that Cheryl's car had a battery charger attached to the vehicle and discovered that some of the items from the home were in the trunk. This gave the initial impression that the perpetrator was planning to hotwire the car in order to transport the stolen items. But the oddity was that there was no need to hotwire it because Cheryl's keys were inside the house in her purse exactly where you would expect them to be. So it didn't take long for law enforcement to conclude that this crime scene may have been staged. So the police took fingerprints from all over the house, including from the light bulb in the garage that had been loosened. And interestingly, they were able to lift two very clear fingerprints from that bulb. Investigators found red fibers on the comforter in the master bedroom, which were the same color red as a pair of gloves found inside the garage. Law enforcement also discovered semen on the comforter in the master bedroom. Still in the master bedroom, the words die bitch that had been scrawled on the bedroom wall were painted with a beige paint. And in doing so, somebody had stepped in the paint because there were shoe prints tracked in that same beige paint all throughout the house. Law enforcement would also find a reddish brown hair on Cheryl's blood-stained nightgown and a gray hair on both a paintbrush and a piece of cardboard in the garage all potentially telling pieces of physical evidence in the case. Law enforcement would also examine the family's answering machine. Ultimately, there were 10 messages from concerned friends and family. One was from Cheryl's brother, Doug. It said, Cheryl, Cheryl or John, pick up if anybody is in the house. Please pick up the phone. We need to find out what's going on. Three of them were from John Feeney. It would later be determined that on Sunday, February 26th, John had made two attempts to call home. But after there was no answer, he would leave a pair of messages on the machine. Then on Monday morning, John tried phoning his residence for a third time. And when he got the machine again, he left this message, quote, Cheryl, this is John. I'm getting really freaked out. Can you call me back? Statistically, 90% of all murders are committed by men. And while women only make up 20% of the victims, when a woman is the victim, two thirds of the time she has been murdered by an intimate partner, a family member, or a friend. So all eyes turned to John Feeney. Within a few hours of discovery of the bodies, John Feeney was informed about the murders over the phone by his father, Clarence Feeney. John would quickly return home to Springfield, and as soon as he returned to town, his Mustang was impounded by the police, and he was brought in for questioning. John would agree to the taking of hair and blood samples for testing. He turned over numerous personal and financial records, and he agreed to answer questions from authorities in what would be their first of three interviews by law enforcement. Within a few short days, the family would be laid to rest at the Green Lawn Cemetery in northern Springfield, Missouri. Shortly after the funeral, John was asked by law enforcement to write out a statement providing a detailed account of his movements during the weekend the family was murdered. 
Investigators would also send questionnaires to some 1,800 educators who attended the Interface 95 conference in Osage Beach. This would help them piece together a timeline to corroborate John's whereabouts that weekend. Next, police would return both the Mustang and custody of his home back over to John. And John, well, he surprised a lot of people when he decided to move back into the house where his family had just been murdered. John would be placed on administrative leave from his teaching job at Glendale High School in order to recover from the trauma, which would not be easy as just over two months after the crimes were committed, the Springfield Newsleader, a local newspaper, started publishing some less than flattering allegations against John that had been provided to them by law enforcement. No kidding. It was reported that John had allegedly supplied alcohol to underage students, many of them female, and drank with them on numerous occasions, including at a downtown bar and on a school-sponsored trip to Bermuda. It was also stated that he was a fan of the role-playing game Vampire the Masquerade and that he liked to play with his students, even though the game involved assuming the role of a vampire and killing people. In response, John filed a lawsuit against the major case squad in May of 1995, and he sought a gag order against them because he believed that the information they had leaked was ruining his reputation. Interestingly, John would elect to drop the lawsuit within a few days after it being filed, as documents showed that the defendants were planning to challenge John on the witness stand. And remember that this was a civil proceeding, not a criminal case where the defendant has the right not to testify. The witness list also made it clear that the defense was planning to call upon some witnesses, some girlfriends, who were going to share some unflattering stories about John's character. So he dismissed the lawsuit. But the damage was done. In July, John announced that he was resigning his teaching job at Glendale High School, stating that the emotional loss of his family made it too difficult to continue. Investigators also asked John to submit to a lie detector test, and although he had been cooperating with authorities, that was a request that he would deny based upon advice from legal counsel Sean Askinosi. And what about these girlfriends? Well, during his initial questioning, John would state to investigators that he had never been involved in an extramarital affair, but they would eventually discover that John had cheated on his wife, no less than with four different women, and three of these women were fellow educators he became involved with in 1990 and 1991. The fourth woman was a science teacher from Mansfield named Pam Probert. That relationship began while they were both attending a teacher conference in 1994, and they would get together whenever they met at these conferences throughout the year. In fact, Pam would report that when John first arrived in Osage Beach on the evening of February 25th, that they went out to dinner. But more on that later. As the case against John Feeney was mounting, investigators learned that John stood to collect around $400,000 from various life insurance policies he had taken out on the family. In fact, John had purchased policies for both himself and Cheryl for $250,000 in September, just four months before her death. In addition, John would also file a claim and receive an insurance payout for the 300 items that were supposedly stolen from his home during the murders. It was at this point that the prosecutor would take the case to a Greene County grand jury. John agreed to provide hair and handwriting samples for the grand jury investigation, but when he was called to testify at the hearing, he invoked his Fifth Amendment right and declined to answer any questions. Undeterred, the prosecution would present testimony and the physical evidence gathered from the scene to the grand jury, with arguably the most important testimony coming from a Ron Gann, a convenience store clerk at a gas station in Springfield, who testified that he saw John stop at the store to purchase fuel at around 1.30 a.m. on February the 26th. He specifically identified John and his red Ford Mustang. 
The testimony put John in Springfield on the night of the murders, a fact that he had specifically denied to investigators. So this was a very, very big deal. So on April the 22nd of 1996, after a 14-month investigation, the grand jury returned a three-count indictment for first-degree murder, charges that, if found guilty of, could subject John Feeney to the death penalty. So the stakes were sky high. So John's defense team would be headed by lawyer Sean Askinosi, and the case would be prosecuted by Greene County prosecuting attorney Daryl Moore. The motive presented by the prosecution in opening statements at trial was that in addition to monetary gain from the family's life insurance policies, John wanted to explore other relationships and free himself from the responsibilities of marriage and fatherhood by murdering his family. They argued that John used the conference in Osage Beach to establish an alibi and that after arriving in Osage Beach on the night of February 25th, he drove back to Springfield to kill his family during the early morning hours of the 26th and then returned to Osage Beach to attend the conference later that day. As the evidence commenced, witness by witness, a timeline was established as to John's whereabouts after he arrived in Osage Beach on the 25th. First, John had met up with Pam Probert, and they went out to dinner. From there, John would actually be pulled over by an officer for speeding at 8.33 p.m., the entire traffic stop was recorded by the dash cam and the officer's patrol car. The officer would issue a speeding ticket and inform John that since he lived over 50 miles away, he would have to hold on to John's driver's license to ensure that he would not skip town without paying the ticket. So we know exactly where John was at 8.30 p.m. that evening. From there, Pam would report that John drove them back to the resort where they were supposed to attend a party but John told her he had a headache and wanted to return to his room. So they went their separate ways at about 9.15 p.m. John would report that he then called Cheryl from his room and spoke with her. Phone records would confirm that this conversation lasted about five minutes. At around 10.30 p.m., John would then go to the Osage Beach Police Department in order to pay off his speeding ticket and pick up his driver's license. Again, his presence was captured on police station surveillance cameras, so there is no question he was in Osage Beach at around 10.30 p.m. that night. And up to this point, both the prosecution and the defendant agreed on the timeline of events. But from there, an investigator testified that John claimed he had returned to his hotel room and spent the rest of the night sleeping. John would then report that he got up the next morning, participated in the conference, and did not leave the resort until 11 a.m. on the 26th. Interestingly, a receipt was found by investigators when they searched his vehicle, which showed a purchase from McDonald's in Osage Beach at 6.59 a.m. that morning. When confronted with the receipt during his initial questioning, John would change his story and stated that he had forgotten that he did wake up early and go to buy breakfast that morning. So at this point, it was clear that John was in Osage Beach at the police station the night before at 10.30 p.m. and that John was also in Osage Beach at the McDonald's at 7 a.m. the next morning. But that left eight and a half hours where his whereabouts was unaccounted for. Which begs the question, is that enough time to travel from Osage Beach to Springfield, murder a family, and then return to the conference? Well, the 90-mile route would have taken approximately one hour and 30 minutes to drive each way. So if you subtract that time off, John would have had five and a half hours in which to murder his family, doctor the crime scene. Definitely enough time to pull this off. However, the million dollar question is, did John come back to Springfield? And that became a huge issue because before John's trial began, the prosecution would suffer a major setback when an important witness from the grand jury proceedings was discredited. Remember Ron Gann, the convenience store clerk that testified he saw John stop at the gas station to purchase fuel for his Mustang at around 1.30 a.m. on the 26th? 
Well, between the time of the grand jury hearing and trial, the defense team would subpoena the timesheets of the convenience store, and those records showed that the clerk did not actually clock in for work until 6.30 a.m. the next morning. So in reality, he wasn't even at the store at 1.30 a.m. to have identified Feeney. So needless to say, an absolutely pivotal witness was now dead in the water. The problem was that Gann was the only eyewitness who could place John in Springfield during that time period. And with no conclusive physical evidence linking him to the murders, the case against John Feeney became very circumstantial. The trial would feature conflicting testimony about him from a number of character witnesses. Several testified that John was a very devoted husband, father, and teacher who often spoke glowingly of his family. Others stated that he often complained about them and gave off the impression that he never really wanted children to begin with. In addition, there were allegations of John providing alcohol to underage students, and there was also testimony from one former female student who claimed that John once asked her if she was naked during a phone conversation. And then the role-playing game, Vampire the Masquerade, was actually brought up at trial as the prosecution inferred that John may have wanted to take on this fantasy and assume the role of a real-life murderer. However, a longtime friend testified that he had engaged in role-playing games with John for over a decade, and he never gave off the impression that he had murderous fantasies. Testimony was also provided by the four women who John had extramarital affairs with. But the prosecution was taken by surprise when Pam Probert stated that they had broken off the affair in the previous year. She also stated that while she and John had dinner together on the 25th, that they had no plans to spend the night together and she had no expectations of any sexual relationship at that point. Interestingly, these women with whom he had an affair with all stated that John spoke fondly of his family and had never openly expressed any desire to end his marriage with Cheryl. There was also some controversy about the $250,000 life insurance policy John had taken out on Cheryl four months prior to the murder. A handwriting expert would testify that the signature on the policy did not match Cheryl's and may have been forged, but could not say with any certainty whether John was the person who forged it. And the defense was quick to get the expert to confirm that the attached form with Cheryl's medical history written out was in fact made out in Cheryl's handwriting, evidencing that she at least participated in part of the process of gaining the additional life insurance. The defense also called a number of people who interacted with John on the 26th at the conference who testified that they didn't notice anything unusual about him that would have suggested that he had returned from an all-night murderous road trip wherein he killed his wife and children. So what about all of that physical evidence that investigators gathered from the crime scene? Well, the defense was more than happy to talk about that. The prosecution had attempted to link the red fibers which had been found on the comforter inside the master bedroom and a leather glove inside the garage to some similar red fibers from the floor mat of John's Mustang, but a definitive match could not be made. The prosecution put on evidence that John's fingerprints were all over the house and his semen was discovered on the comforter. But since he lived there, and that was his bed, that really meant nothing. And the message that had been scrawled on the bedroom wall, die bitch, was actually less important than the fact that the beige paint used to write it had been tracked throughout the house. Experts were able to identify the type of shoe and its size from the paint tracks. But ultimately, the shoe was not a type that was owned by John, and the shoe size was 11, while John's shoe size was a 12. It was also determined that the reddish brown hair on Cheryl's blood-stained nightgown did not match John, nor did the gray hairs found on the paintbrush and in the cardboard inside the garage. And remember the two distinct fingerprints on the light bulb which had been loosened from the garage door motor? They compared those to John's fingerprints, not a match. The physical evidence 
just was not tying John to the crime. But the prosecution had one last shot, and it was one of the weirdest tangents of the case. But little Tyler's autopsy revealed that he had hepatitis B, and sexual transmission is the most common way to contract the virus. So investigators seriously looked at the possibility that Tyler had been violated on the night of his death. And recall that at the beginning of the investigation, John had voluntarily submitted samples of his blood to the authorities. So they tested John's blood. And guess what? Those results showed that he did not have hepatitis B. In fact, the evidence would be that law enforcement would test 155 people who had a known connection to Tyler, and they submitted those blood samples to the Missouri Department of Health to see if any of them would test positive for hepatitis B. There were no matches. Ultimately, the state failed to come up with an explanation as to how Tyler contracted the virus, and even the medical examiner admitted he couldn't determine with any certainty whether the boy had been assaulted on the night that he was murdered. So both sides made their closing arguments and the jurors retired to the deliberation room. After electing a foreman, they took an initial straw poll to see how the jury was leaning. The vote was 5-4 conviction, 5 for acquittal, and 2 undecided. But as they gradually broke down each detail about the case, a unanimous verdict was reached. In the end, they felt there was just way too much reasonable doubt for a conviction, and after deliberating for only five hours, the jury found John not guilty of all three murders. After the verdict, Cheryl's parents would file a wrongful death lawsuit against John to prevent him from collecting any of the life insurance benefits. In 1997, they would reach a settlement in the matter, but the terms would not be disclosed. John would state that he hired a private investigator to search for the killer, but that never went anywhere. And the major case squad announced that the investigation into the three murders would not be reopened as they had no other suspects. Interestingly, when this story was featured on Dateline, some of the jurors were interviewed and asked how many believed John was innocent and not one of them raised their hands. But they all agreed that the prosecution had not proven the case beyond a reasonable doubt. John would eventually move to South America to become a missionary and has faded from the memories of most of the residents of Southwest Missouri. Of significance is that a granite bench was erected at the Victims Memorial Garden of Phelps Grove Park in Springfield, Missouri in honor of Cheryl Tyler and Jennifer Feeney. So that's the episode. Did the jury get it right? Let me know in the comment sections below. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, hit that like button for me. And if you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Smash that subscribe button for me now. Um, Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you've been watching Lawyer Up. <music>